Let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We've got lots of scriptures to look at this morning. And that'll be our first one. Uh, many of you, I know, uh, most, some, I'm not sure how many, uh, have been following along in our uh, congregational Bible reading this year, and we are finishing up the chronological reading of the life of Christ this week. The schedule that uh, I put together did not carry us all the way through the month of April. It's going to get us through uh, this week, uh, well, mostly this week, uh, but we need to continue our chronological reading of the New Testament, and I have made that available out here where on the table, you know, where we make things available. Um, I, I never know what to call that. The table with all the stuff on it. Uh, but you'll see some of these. And I think I made about 85 or 90 copies. And I can send out a digital copy of this as well. But this is the rest of the year. Starting with Acts chapter 1, going through the rest of the year. So uh, if you want one of those, pick one of those up and we can all continue reading together. For those who become parents, that is, I, I think, perhaps the most significant event in their life, aside, of course, from obedience to the gospel and a new life in Christ. There's just nothing like the experience of becoming a parent. And those of you who are parents, you know exactly what I mean by that. You understand exactly what I'm saying. I remember when Kenley was born. In fact, I was talking to her about this just a few days ago on her eighth birthday, talking to her about the day that she was born and how that day eight years ago seems like it was just two years ago or maybe even less than that in, in some respects. The time flies so quickly. And I was remembering that day and telling her about that day and how excited we were and how anxious and nervous and terrified we were and, and, and all of those feelings that come with that. There is just no other event like that. And yet what's really interesting to me about this is that as we come into parenthood, none of us have any clue what we're doing. Without fail, when you have a child, someone comes up to you and says, you know, they don't come with instruction manuals. Well, that's right. They don't. And I remember when Stacy and I brought Kinley home from the hospital. So she's two or three days old now. And we, we laid her on the bed. And of course, you know, after about two hours of just sitting there and looking at her and smiling and thinking about how perfect and beautiful and amazing she is. I remember we both looked at each other and we said, what are we supposed to do? None of us have a clue as to what we're supposed to do with these children whom God has given to us. And I remember, I remember thinking, what is my job here? What is my purpose here as a father to this child? I want to consider that with you this morning. What is a parent's purpose and you might say, that's a big topic, and there's a lot of things that you could say, and that's certainly true. But what I want to do with you this morning is suggest to you four things that we see from a big picture perspective are a parent's responsibility. And for those of you who like alliterative sermons, alliteration, where every point starts with the same letter, today's your day. And maybe this will be an easy to remember sermon. All right, so let's, let's talk about this. What is a parent's purpose? First of all, I want to suggest to you that our purpose as parents is to provide a spiritual foundation for these children whom God has given to us. That's the first thing. This is our fundamental job. Everything else flows from this. We are to provide a spiritual foundation because eternal things are the only things that last. The things of this world are temporary. The material possessions that we accumulate throughout our lives, it's temporary. All of those will rust and decay or fall apart. But it's the eternal things that last. 
And so in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul talks about those who live with this eternal perspective. He uses the expression here, living by the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. You see the contrast here? We who are believers in Christ are people who live by the Spirit. We are not giving in to the fleshly indulgences. We are not giving over to the carnal passions. We are being led by the Spirit, which means we are thinking about eternity. We are thinking about what God says about eternity and what God says about how we're supposed to live in this life. The Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 3 says it like this. Colossians chapter 3 very familiar text, but here Paul says, Colossians 3 and verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Focus your mind on eternal things not things that are on the earth. Now, can we apply this principle to parenting? If it's true for us that we as believers should be people who are led by the Spirit, should be people who set our minds on things above, should we not teach our kids to do the same? Should we not be trying to train our children to see things from the eternal perspective and not from the worldly perspective? And so what this means practically is we are providing a spiritual foundation for them. There are so many other things that we could pursue in life that ultimately are of no value. In Isaiah chapter 55, there's a passage here that is not talking about parenting by any stretch. But there's a principle here that I think is applicable to this point. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 1. Listen, he begins. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. You don't have any money, but come buy and you can eat. Does that seem kind of strange? The point is, it's a free gift. God is making available to you a free gift. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. God is extending this invitation to people. Come and drink, come and eat, come and enjoy the good things which I am giving to you. Why would you do that? Verse 2 gives us the reason. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Why would we accept God's invitation? Verse 1. To come and buy the wine and the milk from him. Verse 2 says, because everything else, everything else is going away. Everything else is vain. The things that last are the things that come from God. Why would we spend our money on things that are actually not bread and things that don't satisfy? That's the question of verse 2. Nothing else satisfies in the way that God does. And we need to teach that to our children. That God fills the gaps that nothing else can fill. That God is the thing, the one, the person, the only thing, the only one, the only person who makes sense in this world. I'm going to 2 Timothy chapter 3 now. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We have an example of this. Someone providing a spiritual foundation for their child. And we're going to come back to this a little bit later in the lesson. But I want you to notice the wording that Paul uses here in this chapter. Chapter 3, 2 Timothy, verse 14. 
You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings. Now, Paul's talking to Timothy here, and he says, Timothy, from your childhood, you have known the sacred writings. That would, of course, be the Old Testament scriptures. And we know from chapter 1 where Timothy learned them. He learned them in his childhood from his mother and his grandmother who were providing a spiritual foundation for him. And that foundation was built upon the scriptures which God has given. Now I want you to notice what Paul says about those scriptures. Verse 15, that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Notice what Paul says in verse 15, the scriptures are able to do. They are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation in Christ. When I was holding Kinley in the hospital, she was a day old at the most at this point. And I remember sitting in a chair with my knees together and her laying on my lap. She can't hear me or at least not in any sense of understanding. She can't even see me at that point, unless I'm this close to her face. But I remember having her in my lap one day old saying, sweetie, I want to tell you about Jesus. You see, it's never too early to start. I wasn't doing that because she could understand me. I wasn't doing that because I thought that that would lead to anything immediately. But I was doing that because of this passage. The scriptures can lead us to salvation in Christ. And parents, isn't that what we want for our kids? We want them to grow up and become Christians. How can we do that? By teaching them scriptures. And by providing a spiritual foundation for them. So here's the second thing that we need to do as parents. We need to protect them from the evils in the world. We need to protect them from the evils that are in the world. Parents are charged with shepherding the hearts of our kids. And part of shepherding is protecting. There's other parts to it, but part of shepherding is protecting. I'm going to Proverbs chapter 4. And I would encourage you when you get there, put your marker in Proverbs, because we're actually going to come back to the book of Proverbs a few, few more times today. Proverbs chapter 4, look with me at verse 23. Proverbs 4, verse 23. A passage that you probably know. Proverbs 4, 23. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Now, there are some translation differences here. Your translation might say, keep your heart, guard your heart with all diligence, because from your heart flow the issues of life, the springs of life. What this passage is saying is we all must protect our hearts because if we don't protect our hearts, then it will lead us to all kinds of trouble and all kinds of problems. Jesus talked about this. I'm going to Luke chapter six. Luke chapter six. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spoke about this. In Luke 6 and verse 45, he said, The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth 
what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. What is in our heart determines what comes out of our mouths. What is in our heart determines what we do with our hands and with our feet. What is in our heart determines what comes into our minds and our thoughts. The heart determines the actions. And so if we ever make a choice to pursue actions that God would say are wrong and sinful, it first originated from within. And that's why Solomon says, guard your hearts, protect your hearts, build walls around your hearts and close the gate and shut the bars of the door and put the lock on it and put the armed guard at the door. Guard your heart. Proverbs 23 in verse 26. This is an appeal from a father to his child. Proverbs 23 and verse 26. Give me your heart, my son, and let your eyes delight in my ways. Give me your heart. Parents, we need to be praying that for our children, that they would give us their hearts. Give us their hearts so that we can protect them, so that we can take care of them, so that we can shape them and mold them. There are so many dangers in the world that we need to protect their hearts from. Their friends and their peers, their media consumption, television, internet, social media, all of those things can become pathways for evil into their heart. I want to suggest to you that protecting them from the world happens in stages. It changes over time. As our children get older, become more responsible and more mature and more independent, we adjust, don't we? We make changes. We allow them to have certain amounts of freedom and it increases as their independence and as their maturity increases as well. We can't keep them in a safe bubble forever and then one day spring them into the world with no preparation. I'm not suggesting that we do that. I'm suggesting, though, that we use caution. And we have to start when they're young. Protecting them, keeping their innocence when they're young. And helping them as they grow. In John chapter 17, I love this prayer, which Jesus prayed shortly before his death. He's praying about his apostles here, but I want you to apply what he says to our children. John chapter 17, look with me in, with verse, uh, in verse 12, beginning. John 17, verse 12. While I was with them, again, apostles, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them. And not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word. Isn't that our first point from this morning? Provide a spiritual foundation, which is built upon the scriptures. Jesus says to God about the apostles, I've given them your word. They know what their task is. They know what their job is. I have given them your word and the world hates them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. That's our point. Jesus says about the apostles, I have guarded their hearts. I have guarded them and protected them, but now it's time for me to leave. I've got to leave. I've got to go, but they're going to stay here in the world. Father, guard them from the world and the dangers that are in it. 
as parents, we need to be able to say with Jesus, Father, those whom you have given to me, I've given them your word. And I have kept them all the time that I was with them. Please, Father, guard them from the world. We need to protect them. But it can't end there. See, we can't just protect them from the world forever. We have to prepare them for the world. They're not going to live under our roofs forever. At some point, they're going to leave. And it may be because they've chosen to enter into the workforce. Or maybe they leave because they're going to college. Or maybe they leave because we're tired of them being home and we kick them out. But at some point, they're going to leave. Will they be ready? Have we prepared them for what is in the world? It isn't enough to protect them and shelter them because we can't do it forever. We have to prepare them so that they will be ready for the attacks of Satan, which they will face in the world. So how do we do that? I want to suggest three things. First, I think we need to talk to them about sin. This next part's going to blow your socks off. We need to talk to them about sin and its pleasures. Now, you thought I was going to say sin and its dangers. I'll get there in a minute. Sin and its pleasures. Do you remember this text in Hebrews 11, verses 24 and 25, where it says that Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. He chose to leave Egypt and suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the passing pleasure of sin. I think sometimes when we talk to our kids, we're not real with them about some of these things. We're not completely honest and forthright with them, not because we're trying to be dishonest or deceptive, but maybe we're afraid that if we tell them that sin is fun, that we're actually encouraging them to go out and do it. And we don't want to do that, of course. But here is how that works out practically. Can we take a topic that no parent ever wants to talk to their kids about? In fact, no parent ever wants to talk to their kids about it so much that now people write books to parents telling them how to talk to their kids about the subject that they don't want to talk about. You know what I'm talking about, right? So here's what happens. I don't want to tell my children that sex is fun and that it feels good and that it's a great bonding experience. I don't want to tell them that because then they might go out and try it. So I'll tell you what, I'm just not going to talk about it at all. I'm just never going to talk about it at all. And if it ever comes up and if the preacher ever says something about sexual immorality in a sermon or fornication, or if he does a sermon on the positive side of it about the beauty of God's design, for marriage, in the sexual relationship, I, I'm just going to say to my kids, well, you know, we're just not going to talk about that. Just sweep that under the rug. Let's act like it doesn't exist. And then on their wedding night, we're going to say, good luck. How does that work for us? Or maybe we just take this Victorian attitude about it. Well, that's just something that one of these days you'll figure out. Let's just never talk about it because it's gross and nasty and ugh. And then they come to Mr. Ben's senior high school teenage Bible class. And Ben will talk about anything. <laughs> and we talk about something like sex. 
and God's design for it and the beauty of marriage and the beauty of what God created in the sexual relationship. But all their life, all they've heard is, no, no, it's taboo. Don't talk about that. It's gross. It's nasty. Don't ever do it until you're married. Then it's great. So now our kids have questions. Now they want to find out something. And they know they can't come to mom and dad because mom and dad have been so hush-hush about it and acted like this doesn't even exist. So where do they go for answers? First, they go to their peers at school. Brilliant. I believe Jesus said something about the blind leading the blind, both falling into the ditch, right? Second place they go, Google. God forbid. Who knows what kind of filth and putridity they're going to see on the internet. Mom, Dad, don't you want to be the one who talks to them about these subjects? Wouldn't you rather them come to you? A trusted source for answers? Rather than going to some idiot with a blog on, on the internet? Don't you want them to talk to you? Yeah, but Ben, that's just awkward and it's just, I know it's awkward. Nobody said parenting would be easy. But see, this is preparation. This is our job. I'm going to Proverbs chapter one. Proverbs chapter one. It's not just sex. That's not the only sin that's fun and pleasurable. There's other ones too. Folks, if sin wasn't fun, nobody would do it. If sin was like math, the world would be a great place to live. Thanks, Todd. <laughs> But we got to be real with them. And we need to let them know, yes, it is fun to go out and, and drink with your buddies and party and be irresponsible. Sure, it's fun. Yeah, you can have a good time for a little while. But see, we also need to talk to them about sin and its consequences. Yeah, going out and drinking with your buddies on the weekend is a lot of fun until you get in the car afterward and you get a DUI. You spend the night in jail uh, until you drive your car and you hit somebody else and you take somebody's life. Yeah, sin is, is, is a lot of fun for a little while. It's a lot of fun to, 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 to go out and, and, and drink at the bar with your buddies after work uh, until you come home and you treat your wife like dirt because you're not thinking clearly and alcohol makes you abusive and angry. Yeah, it's fun for a little while, but the fun doesn't last. And this is what Solomon is trying to convey in the book of Proverbs. Notice these passages. Proverbs 1, verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Chapter 2, and verse 1. My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you. Chapter 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Chapter 4, verse 1. Hear, O sons, the instruction of a father, and give attention that you may gain understanding. For I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my instruction. The first seven chapters of Proverbs is a father sitting down with his son saying, Son, I need to talk to you about some things. What kinds of things does he talk to him about? He talks to him about things like sex, money, adultery, marriage, the choice of friends, alcohol. He talks to him about real and relevant issues. Because this is what parents are supposed to do. It's our job to do this. Not the teacher at school, 
not the teacher in the sex ed class, not Google, and frankly, not even their Bible class teacher. It's a parent's job. Talk to them about sin. How do we prepare them? Secondly, talk to them about their Savior and His wonderful grace. Talk to them often about Jesus and His sacrifice because of His love for them. And how He came to save them. And how they don't have to be perfect. And how it's okay if they sin. Because God's grace is there to save them. <coughs> And then thirdly, we prepare them by equipping them with answers for life's most important questions. We need to talk to our kids about things like, how do I know that God exists? How do I know that I can trust the Bible? Is this really God's word to us? Why am I here where did I come from? What is my purpose in life? The Bible has answers for all of those things. And when our kids are of age to go out into the world and start wrestling with those questions, hopefully we have equipped them with solid biblical answers. So we've provided the spiritual foundation. And we've protected them from the world and its influences. And we've loosened the reins a little bit as they've gotten older, as we've been preparing them to go out into the world and be ready to face the world. And finally, our last job as parents is to present them to the world. It's an acknowledgement on our part that, that their time with us is over and now it's time to release them. Hopefully with that good foundation with a strong heart that was protected from early days and strengthened in the following years and preparation for what they're about to face. If we've done those first three things, then we can be confident that they will be ready to face the world. Are you still in Proverbs chapter four? Look at verse 10 with me. Hear, my son, and accept my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. I you to notice how verse 11 begins. I have directed you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in upright paths. Notice the past tense nature of the verse. I have done this. Now, verse 12. When you walk, your steps will not be impeded. And if you run, you will not stumble. Take hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked. And do not proceed in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not pass by it. Turn away from it and pass on. Notice that transitional language from parent to child. I have directed you. I have led you. But when you walk. Now it's your turn. Now it's your turn to go out into the world. And here are those dangers to watch out for, like we've talked about. Here are those people who are going to try to bring you down. But when you go out into the world and when you begin taking your steps, you remember what I have done for you. I think about Timothy. In Acts chapter 16, on Paul's second missionary journey, Paul comes to the city where Timothy lives. And Paul's looking for someone else to get on the ship and travel with him to other parts of the world spreading the gospel. I don't know how old Timothy is at the time. Many think he's a teenager. I'm not exactly sure, but I do know he's young. How was Timothy ready? To go with the Apostle Paul and begin working with him. How was he made ready? Because his mother and his grandmother provided a spiritual foundation. Timothy grew up a believer. 
And Timothy becomes a Christian. And now he is a gospel preacher traveling with the Apostle Paul because the foundation was there. Because he was prepared that one day he would leave home. And when that day came, he was ready. I think about Daniel. Carried off into Babylonian captivity as a teenager. And yet in Daniel 1 and verse 8, it says that Daniel purposed in his heart to not defile himself with the food from the king. How is it that a teenager, hundreds of miles from his homeland, separated from his family and everyone and everything that he knows, how could Daniel, in those circumstances, stand up for his convictions? Because he had them in the first place. Because the preparation was there for Daniel to make that stand. Ezekiel's the same way. Carried off into captivity. Eight years after Daniel was. But he's about the same age. Ezekiel is a young man too. All of these young men stood for the Lord in difficult circumstances. I'm wrapping this up now, but I, I want you to hear me on something here, okay? Let's make sure that we understand this. As parents, we are not simply trying to raise good, responsible citizens who pay their taxes and don't cheat on their wife. Listen, that's great, okay? But even the atheists are doing that. We're not trying to raise good, responsible citizens. That's not what this is ultimately about. We are raising spiritual warriors who will fight spiritual cosmic battles against the devil and his cohorts. We are raising countercultural thinkers who will question and challenge every single one of the world's expectations. We are raising future child raisers who will do for their children what we are trying to do for them. That's what we're doing. That is our task. We are not just trying to make them good people. Good people who go to work every day and earn an honest living and contribute to society. That's nice. But that's not enough. We are raising disciples. And parents, we want to talk about evangelism and how we need to carry the gospel to, to people who need it. You and I have evangelism opportunities in front of us every day in our children. I hope that God helps us to be up to the challenge. Well, that's our purpose. This is what we're tasked to do. And you say, that's a lot of responsibility. That's right. Which is why parenting is not something we rush into without careful attention and planning. These are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about as we prepare to have them. And once we have, these are the things we must be doing. I appreciate your attention this morning. Hope the lesson's been helpful to you. We all have a role to play in this. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, elders, deacons, all of us. This is all a big family here. We all want to see one another's children thrive and succeed in every measure. If you're here this morning and you're not a child of God, I would suggest to you that God is, God is the greatest parent of all, the greatest father of all, who loves us with a love we cannot understand. And he loves you and he wants you to love him and serve him. And if we can help you do that, we invite you even now, please come forward as we stand and sing together.